button, so I guess we'll just skip it. All right, here we go. <laughs> What's up, guys? Welcome into Taking the Field with Stevie Mac. And on this episode, we're going to talk the Atlas and Cannons clinching the postseason this past weekend. Uh, in segment two, we're going to get to a couple things quickly. I want to get to kind of a, a recap of the Redwoods this past weekend and kind of the chance that they missed this weekend uh, as they had their two home games this past weekend. But again, I kind of want to touch very quickly on that. I don't necessarily want to beat a dead horse on that topic, but really what I want to get into with that segment in particular is this kind of NLL versus PLL thing and really why that still exists and maybe what can be done to maybe move past that. And there was something that I saw on Twitter earlier today that I'll get to with that segment because I thought it was actually kind of funny. So we'll touch on that in uh, segment two. And then segment three, we'll finish out talking some athletes unlimited week three. I'll give you a uh, kind of a week three breakdown uh, as their third week of the season uh, gets going here on Thursday. Um, also kind of recap a little bit of their week two from this past weekend, but mostly kind of a look ahead uh, at week three with that. The audio that you heard, though, if you're listening anywhere, you get your podcast. The audio that you heard to open the show was Carolina Chaos head coach Andy Towers kind of giving his opening statement to his postgame press conference from over the weekend, uh, kind of giving his assessment of their game against the Redwoods from Saturday. And it seemed like he felt pretty positively, at least in his opening statements about their their performance in that game. But I think at the end of the day, you were still kind of that team. You know, you were that team that that lost to the Redwoods when they've kind of been down this season. Obviously, their record going into the weekend um, and their score differential being what it was. And and again, like I said, I'll talk about the Redwoods a little bit in segment two and kind of that missed opportunity, as I mentioned. But that was just the audio uh, that you heard to open the show and also make sure to follow me on YouTube here. For those of you uh, watching this recording of the episode on YouTube live, uh, welcome in first of all, but you can follow me on YouTube and Twitter at Stevie Mac media on both places. You can also follow the show taking the field with Stevie Mac on Apple, Spotify, Odyssey, Amazon music, uh, and a couple other places as well, as well, basically anywhere you get your podcast. But to start out the show, to finally dive into this episode, I had to do a couple of housekeeping things there real quick. But to dive into this episode and the Atlas and Cannons clinching over the weekend, I still think that for me, the Atlas are my favorite to win the championship this season. I think that the Cannons aren't that far behind, as we can tell by the the conference and league standings. I think they're pretty much like one in one a right now, but I do still have the cannons as my favorite um, in that regard. But the cannons were a team that preseason I was actually pretty high on. And I think that I touched a little bit on it at the beginning of the season here on the podcast, but they were definitely a team that preseason I was, was pretty high on going in because when you look at you know, this year's Cannons team and you compare it to maybe last year's Archers team that won the championship a year ago, I feel like you could make some similarities between those two teams. You talk about in the goal, you've got two really talented young goalies that are capable of winning you a lot of games as they've done so far for their respective teams and and really could put you in a championship position as, as Dobson did a year ago and as I think Kirst can do this year for the Cannons. You talk about last year, the veterans on D defense that the archers had. I think that the, the cannons have that similar situation with some of the veterans like Apple that they have this year on their defense. And then both offenses are really solid. I know talking to uh cannons beat writer, Sarah Griffin, a couple episodes ago mentioned that their shooting percentage isn't very good, or at least at the time it wasn't very good. Um, but I still think that their offense is, is super loaded with, with talent and with shooters. And you look at a guy like Matt Campbell and his ability to stretch the field from two so far this year. Um, and that attack that they have with Holman and Nolting, uh, they added Will Manny to that group just a couple weeks ago. So just the depth that they have on offense, and it's been well-established the, 
the offensive firepower that the archers have had the last several years in the PLL. So again, I think you can make a lot of maybe similarities between that archers team a year ago and the cannons team this year. And that's a big reason why I liked them preseason as one of the favorites to, to win the championship this year. And I think that they're in a really solid position to do so. And then looking at the Atlas game against the water dogs, I didn't get to catch the game live, but I went back and, and caught it on replay a little bit later on that same day. And I think the, the defense looked really good. And you look in that second half, they almost uh, up until that 32nd mark of the, of the final score, they, they held the water dogs scoreless, gave up that two pointer right at the end otherwise, but that's a, a really good offense that you held scoreless for virtually the entire second half of that game. And of course, Liam Ettenman was a big reason why making 17 saves overall. And I think that the off the offense did what they are best at, and that's getting everybody involved. And I think that primarily to me, there was two main reasons that the water dogs were able to stay in that game, even though they only lost by one, there was two main reasons that I think they were able to have a chance there at the end. And that's the two pointers that they had. They hit three, I believe it was in that game against the, the Atlas. And also the, the job that Matt DeLuca did in replacing Dylan Ward, he as well, along with Ettenman on the other side, both made 17 saves in that game. So I think when you kind of couple those two things together, it allowed the Water Dogs to stay in a game that, again, they went virtually the entire second half without scoring. And I think they're the last few minutes of the game. The thing that I was most frustrated about with the Atlas and that performance was those last few minutes, those last few possessions that they had, because it really felt like they just had opportunity after opportunity to get one more score and put the water dogs away. And they just didn't seem like they were really interested in doing that. They kind of went more the route of just trying to run out the clock. And then you see at the end how that almost came back to bite them. And that's something that I think it was Ryan Boyle even said on the broadcast was he didn't really love how they handled the end of that game. And then once they hit the two, he was basically like, yep, that's exactly why I didn't like it. You just kept giving them possession after possession to try and get that, that goal to, you know, get back in it and make it a one score game late and make you have to think about it a little bit. So I kind of agreed with him on that. I would have liked to have seen them at least in one of those final few possessions, really try to go for it and not just run out the time because worst case scenario, the exact thing that happened happens, you know, they get a little bit of a run out on a, on a cluster in the midfield and, uh, re steps into a two and nails it. But again, I think that you can't just sit back and expect that you're going to win that game. Cause you look back to the game last season against the water dogs, they played it the exact same way. And the water dogs scored like seven goals in, in about five minutes or whatever it was. And they ended up winning that game. So again, just wasn't really thrilled with their approach at the end of that game, but I'd still say that was a really solid performance by the Atlas overall. And I would also say that there was a lot of people, I think, kind of overreacting, um, especially about the defense after the game, the Atlas game against the Cannons the previous week. And it's games like Sunday, which is why I wasn't totally panicking. Now, did they play great against the, the Cannons the previous week? Not necessarily, but it's games like Sunday where I'm just like that is where they're going to win a championship, right? When guys like Adler are doing what we know he can do, right? And this defense is kind of living up to its billing like I think they did on Sunday. That's where you're going to be able to win a championship this summer if you're the Atlas. And then there was a couple of quotes that I saw from the recap article that the PLL put out about the Atlas Water Dogs game from the respective beat writers. And I wanted to kind of give them credit for these quotes that they had in that article from the Atlas beat writer, Lauren Marola in that article, it says, quote, we have to stop the two pointers. That was our Achilles heel last week. Atlas coach and general manager, Mike Pressler said at halftime of Sunday's game, New York allowed three two pointers against the Boston cannons in Fairfield. And yeah, again, like I said, 
earlier this segment. I think that's one of the two biggest reasons why the Water Dogs had a chance there at the end in that game was A, Matt DeLuca making 17 saves in relief, and also the two pointers that they were able to hit. They were, you know, timely two pointers, especially that one right there at the end. But you figure they had 11 points and six of those were off of two pointers. So again, two weeks in a row, the two pointers really killed the Atlas. But I think overall, outside of those two things, they had a pretty, um, I think, pretty good grasp on that game. And then from Water Dogs beat writer Wyatt Miller, a good friend of the show, Wyatt Miller had him on earlier this season on the show. It says, quote, it was an ugly half of lacrosse and the dogs once again didn't show up when it mattered most. The lone bright spot was Matt DeLuca, who replaced Dylan Ward between the pipes after Ward went 0 for 5 on save opportunities in the first quarter. However, DeLuca's career day was all for naught as the dogs lost their fourth one score game of the season. They also had four power play opportunities and didn't capitalize on any of them. So yeah, exactly. He, he really hits on kind of the two things, or at least the one with the Luca I talked about was kind of the two keys for them even having a, a chance there at the end in that game. And he's absolutely right. They, you know, obviously lost another one goal game. That's something that they haven't really been able to get over the hump this season. And, and be able to make that one more play to be able to flip some of these games in their favor. And I think he puts it pretty pretty perfectly. They, they essentially wasted the relief effort of Matt DeLuca, who did everything in his power to, to keep them in that game as long as he could. So my final thought is this regarding the Cannons and the Atlas clinching a spot in the playoffs this past weekend, is that it's, to me at least, it's the the Atlas and the Cannons kind of 1-1A, one one like I said at the top of the segment. Then it's the Archers, who I think we kind of all forgot about this weekend because they're on a bye this past weekend, but they are still 4-2. and two. They are atop the Western Conference standings. So it's the Atlas and Cannons 1-1A, one one then the Archers, then it's kind of like 50 feet of nothing, I would say. And then it's everybody else is kind of what it feels right feels like right now uh, in the PLL standings as it pertains to kind of championship aspirations. So coming up in segment two on taking the field with Stevie Mack, like I said, we're going to touch quickly at the top of the segment about the Redwoods again and sort of the opportunity missed this past weekend out in California. But then I want to get into this kind of NLL versus PLL thing and get your thoughts on that coming up next on taking the field with Stevie Mack. All right, welcome back. Segment two of Taking the Field with C.V. Max. Segment one talked about the Atlas and Cannons uh, clinching a spot in the playoffs here in 2024. Segment two, going to talk quickly about the Redwoods and then move in to this NLL versus PLL topic. I do have a pretty good quote that I want to get to with that when we get to it. So be prepared for that. But we heard top of the show, for those of you listening, anywhere you get your podcasts, we heard top of the show, the audio from Carolina Chaos head coach, Andy Towers, kind of giving his assessment of their game against the Redwoods, even though it ended up being a loss. And the way I would look at it is as much as I think the Redwoods blew an opportunity this, this weekend, because I said it last week on the podcast, I, I felt like they were going to go one and one this weekend, which would move their record to two and five. They did do that. But I said, Hey, stranger things have happened. If they can somehow do this where they win both games. Now, all of a sudden you're sitting at three and four. If you win both games by a couple goals, you improve your score differential, which wasn't looking so hot at the time. And now all of a sudden your season kind of does a, a 180 and we're talking about a whole different scenario, but they didn't do that. Obviously they go one and one, they're two and five on the year. I believe their score differential actually got worse because of the loss to the whip snakes in that game. So again, kind of an opportunity missed for them, but I feel like at the same time, it was kind of an opportunity missed for the chaos as well, because the way I see it, if you win that game on Saturday, 
I would venture to guess that the Redwoods weren't going to come out on Sunday and, and beat the Whipsnakes. Obviously, we know that they didn't. But if you're the chaos, you had an opportunity to go win that game and essentially end the Redwoods season right there and and essentially send them to an early rebuild, which as I as I saw on the podcast last week, a couple of people commented on that on last week's episode and basically said they would be all for that, that they would be in favor of the Redwoods kind of scrapping it this season and, and kind of getting a early head start on the, the rebuild this off season. So essentially if you're the Redwoods, you had a chance to kind of flip your season this weekend. Didn't do it. If you're the chaos, you had a chance to end the Redwoods season. Essentially didn't do that either. So the whip snakes came in on Sunday and basically handled the job for you. But again, I just wanted to get that out. I just wanted to hit on that very quickly. What I want to do with this segment, though, is talk about this NLL versus PLL thing because it's popped up on multiple occasions over the last couple of years, especially. I saw it pop up again this weekend. And I really want to know why is this still a thing and how do we change that? Because I feel like it's kind of just become this weird rivalry on social media between the NLL and PLL fans. And I think for me personally, kind of from a local perspective here in Michigan, it kind of feels like the, the rivalry between fan bases with, you know, Michigan, Michigan state or Michigan, Ohio state and how toxic that those rivalries have gotten on social media the last couple of years. So for me, it, it kind of compares to something like that. And again, I kind of want to know why six years into the PLL is this still a thing and and how do we change that? Because for me, it's not something that I think is good for the sport because we talk about grow the sport and grow the game and and this and that all the time. And I think that when you have these two leagues that are successful at what they do, whether it's the NLL with box lacrosse or the PLL with with the field game, they're both very good at what they do. And they're both very good at, at representing the game. And I think growing the game in different ways and, and things like that. And of course, things like visibility is a big part of that with their deals with ESPN and those kinds of things. But again, it's like, why does it have to be a this or that thing? Because I don't really think that it does. I think that if you want to be a fan of the NLL, cool, be a fan of the NLL. You want to be a fan of the PLL, cool, be a fan of the PLL. You want to be a fan of both, be a fan of both. Like I, I don't get why there has to be like a this or that kind of viewpoint on it. And it was really funny because as I mentioned, top of the segment, the kind of the funny quote that I saw actually comes from Adam Levy on Twitter, the uh, NL, the NLL writer uh, used Twitter AI to ask this very question and basically said which one was better. And the response that the AI gave was absolutely perfect. I'm not going to read the whole thing because it goes on for a couple paragraphs, but I full I pulled a uh, couple of quotes from it and I thought it was actually pretty funny. So Adam Levy uh, allowed me to, to use that for this episode. It says, so uh, quote, so which one is better? It's like asking if you prefer chocolate or vanilla. It's a matter of personal taste, my friend. If you're a traditionalist who loves the indoor game, the NLL might be your jam. Another quote later at the very end says, quote, in the end, it's all about the love of the game. Whether you're cheering for the NLL or the PLL, just remember to have fun, support your favorite team. And then this is actually my favorite part of this quote. And then it says, and maybe bring some nachos to the game. So yeah, I think as, as silly as this is, and it's, it's almost comical in a way. I think it does kind of answer the question pretty well. It's it's not a this or a that thing. It's just whatever your preference is, whatever you want to be a fan of. And I know even from a player perspective, you look across the PLL or you look across the NLL, whichever way you want to go with it, there's guys that play in both. I know a couple summers ago, people kind of joked that the – you know, the, the Buffalo bandits should be called the Buffalo chaos because like half their roster also played for the chaos. So again, it's like, I, I don't think that there necessarily needs to be a, a this or that approach to it. 
And I mean, shoot, even Twitter AI is as goofy as it is. Even Twitter AI kind of agrees with that. And again, I'll, I'll read that last quote again. It says, in the end, it's all about the love of the game. Whether you're cheering for the NLL or the PLL, just remember to have fun, support your favorite team. And then, like I said, my favorite part of it, and maybe bring some nachos to the game. So yeah, I think that pretty much summarizes it right there is that it's just about growing the game. It doesn't have to be, you know, which side does it better or, you know, who's been around longer or this or that. It's just, hey, we're both trying to accomplish the same thing here. So let's let's just do that. Uh, let's get to a couple comments here from the YouTube live chat again, doing this recording of the episode on YouTube live as well. Again, mentioned top of the show. You can follow me on Twitter and YouTube at Stevie Mac Media is the handle on both. Uh, Michael Ramirez, going back to segment one, talking the Atlas and Cannons, says both teams, Atlas and Cannons, have balance on both sides of the field. Advantage Atlas at faceoff. Pretty well said. I mean, they're they're absolutely deep uh, up and down the field. Atlas, I mentioned last week in that episode, in kind of saying how I wasn't concerned about the Atlas after that loss to the Cannons. I mean, facts are facts. They had 10 guys in the all-star game a couple weeks ago. So yeah, they're, they're definitely two teams that are, that are stacked up and down their lineups. And then, yeah, you do have to give the advantage to Atlas, uh, at the face off with Trevor Baptiste as always, uh, from global SEM. He says, I don't get it personally in a uh, reference to segment two here talking NLL versus PLL says, I don't get it personally started watching pro lacrosse a couple of years ago after playing mainly field with some box experience. There's no need for a rivalry because they're both great. Yeah. And, and that's the exact point of this segment. I think is I would hundred percent agree with that. There is absolutely no need for a kind of this or that kind of debate and, and you know, I, I do agree that while the NLL has been around longer, you know, the PLL has done, and I don't think you can deny it. The PLL has done a lot of good since they've been around as well, just in the last five and a half, six years or so. So yeah, I, I do agree. It doesn't have to be a this or that kind of scenario. Uh, a couple more from Michael says, maybe, uh, maybe more promotions during each other's seasons, see some NLL commercials during PLL title game and vice versa. Yeah, I do think that would definitely help. It does seem, although it seemed like more recently the NLL has been better about it on social media, but it seems like that sort of cross promotion has been a little bit taboo between the two leagues. Although, like I said this weekend, the NLL uh, did do a little bit with that, especially um, promoting guys like Jeff Teat after he got the single season PLL points record and things like that. So there was some posting on their side. So I, I do think having it not be so taboo, kind of that cross promotion, I think would go a long way with that. And then he also says there's room enough or there's enough room for everyone to grow dinners all grow together. Um, yeah. And again, like I said, I think that the main objective when you talk about grow the game is that it's, it's, it's inclusive, right? You're trying to accomplish the same goal at the end of the day. So just focusing on ways like how he suggests with kind of that cross promotion idea, finding ways to do things like that, I think is going to go a long way because if the two leagues kind of treat it as a, as a us versus them or a this versus that kind of thing, then I think the fans have been and will treat it that way as well. Final segment of the show coming up, segment three here of Taking the Field with Stevie Mack. We'll talk some Athletes Unlimited Pro Lacrosse on the other side. All right, welcome back. Final segment of the show, Taking the Field with Stevie Mack. Starting out the show, we talked at uh, Atlas and Cannons clinching the postseason this past weekend. Segment two touched very quickly uh, on the Redwoods weekend this past weekend out in California and the sort of missed opportunity there, but really took a sort of a deep dive into this whole NLL versus PLL thing. Got a couple comments there. 
in the mix. Final segment here of Taking the Field with Stevie Mack. Want to talk some Athletes Unlimited uh, heading into week three of their season. A, a pretty short season in Athletes Unlimited. They only play four weeks, but they play three games each weekend. So it does kind of add up over time pretty quickly. So they're in week three upcoming out of four. So kind of want to do a quick breakdown of that. The biggest mover uh, on the individual leaderboard from this past weekend, if you're not familiar with Athletes Unlimited and the way that they do things, it's the best way I can describe it. And I described it this way on the show a couple of years ago is it's basically like real life fantasy lacrosse. So just like in the PLL with fantasy lacrosse, you get points for goals, assists, ground balls, you know, saves, whatever the case may be. And then on the flip side, you get points taken away for kind of the opposite for, you know, goals against face off loss, um, turnovers, things like that. It kind of works that similar way, but it's, it's like real life, real time, uh, fantasy lacrosse. So the biggest mover in the individual leaderboard was Sam Geyers back who moved up 25 spots on that individual leaderboard, uh, had eight goals and one assist over the weekend, and she'll play on Allie Kennedy's team this weekend. They also have four captains each week in Athletes Unlimited Lacrosse. Again, if you're unfamiliar with the format, and week to week, the captains can change, although uh, historically, two of the four more often than not have been uh, Sam Apuzo and Taylor Moreno, same case this week. There'll be two of the four captains again, and uh, we'll break down each of the four rosters here in just a second. But again, biggest mover of the weekend last week was Sam Geyer's back moved up 25 spots, uh, I believe, into the 20th spot overall. And eight out of the top 20, speaking of the top 20, eight of those top 20 players currently are rookies. You have Emily Knowles is fifth. Izzy Skein, the uh, sharpshooter out of Northwestern, has had a really nice start to her pro career, is sixth. Cassidy Weeks is 10th. Ellie Macera, another player that's uh, started her pro career really well so far. Ellie Macera is 12th. Kendall Halpern is 13th. Madison Ahern out of uh, Notre Dame is 14th. Cassidy Spillis is 16th. And Isabella Peterson, who had a really nice opening weekend uh, two weeks ago in Athletes Unlimited, uh, Isabella Peterson is 17th again in that top 20. Uh, but to quickly kind of give a quick breakdown of each of the four rosters going into week three, the captains were Sam Apuzo, uh, Taylor Moreno, Allie Kennedy, and Charlotte North. Uh, on Team Apuzo, she gets the top spot this week in Athletes Unlimited, that number one spot in the rankings. Uh, she beat Taylor Moreno for the second time already this season. And her team features Dempsey Arsenal, which really is no surprise. It seems like on an almost weekly basis, uh, she ends up with, and I said this last week as well, she either ends up with one of or both Dempsey Arsenal and Kenzie Kent. So this week she gets Dempsey Arsenal back on her squad. Uh, she picks up Cassidy Weeks, who had three goals, two assists, seven ground balls, and three cause turnovers in week two. And this is her second consecutive week on Apuzo's team. She also has Maggie Hall, another really good rookie this year, uh, who sits just outside that top 20 overall at number 21, had five goals, three assists last weekend. Uh, Madison Ahern, who we talked about just a moment ago, one of those other top rookies so far this season, had four goals and three assists last weekend for Apuzo's team and actually had a, a, a hat trick on Sunday in their win. And then uh, Team Apuzo's goalie, again, is going to be Katie Glynn. On Team Moreno, that's Taylor Moreno, the goalie. Uh, another solid roster put together by Taylor Moreno. She has Marie McCool, who was actually one of the Week 2 captains last week. Uh, Isabella Peterson, who had eight goals and three assists back in Week 2. Kendall Halpern, who, again, is number 13 overall on the individual leaderboard, one of those really good rookies this summer. A uh, second straight week for her on Team Moreno had seven ground balls and six cause turnovers last week, and then also has Maddie Burns on defense, 
the 35th overall player on the individual leaderboard uh, is also another uh, really solid rookie on the defensive end, was the Big Ten Defender of the Year, and this is her second straight week on Moreno's squad. Then you look at Allie Kennedy, not someone that especially this season has really been a, a captain, it seems like, all too often. But again, that is the case with, with kind of how things work with Athletes Unlimited. Um, so Kennedy, one of the four captains this week. I would say probably looking at it on paper has one of the better offenses going into week three in athletes unlimited has Ali Mastriani, Sydney black, another really good rookie in Sydney black, like this rookie class this year in athletes unlimited has been absolutely ridiculous. And Sydney black has been a part of that. And uh, also as Sam Geyer's back, who we talked about at the top of this segment, her goalie, her main goalie at least is going to be Britt Reed, who is another one of those players that, on more than one occasion, is a team captain herself. And then the defense in front of her is going to be absolutely unfair, has Lizzie Colson, Cassidy Spillis, Meg Dowdy, and Courtney Taylor. So not only if you're an opposing offense this weekend, do you have to contend with scoring on Britt Reed, but the defense that's going to be lined up in front of her is going to absolutely put the clamps on, I think, over this next couple days, starting on Thursday night. And then the final team for week three is uh, Charlotte North's team. The offense is going to feature, obviously, Charlotte. Uh, she also adds Ellie Macera and Kenzie Kent on that offense. Really uh, have enjoyed watching Ellie Macera so far this summer. And then Livy Rosenzweig, who also made a big move up the leaderboard this weekend, moved up 20 spots over this past weekend will take most of the draws for this team. She had 29 total in week two across their three games that, that they played over the weekend. So I think that's going to be a big piece to this offense for Charlotte North's team is, is having somebody like Rosenzweig that can win you a lot of draws and just keep getting the ball to that offense. You kind of maybe draw a comparison to somebody like Trevor Baptiste in the PLL with the Atlas, his ability to essentially play, make it, take it. I think that's maybe what Rosenzweig brings this to this team with uh, Charlotte North's team. And then on defense, they have Sydney scales and Kayla wood as two of kind of their features on defense uh, with Kaylee waters as their primary goalie. So that'll do it for this episode of Taking the Field with Stevie Mac, also streaming on YouTube Live. Again, Stevie Mac Media is my handle on both YouTube and Twitter. Make sure to follow on both of those, and you can also find the show anywhere you get your podcasts, including Apple, Spotify, Odyssey, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, and more. Make sure to like, comment, and share on this episode on any of those channels, and I will talk to you guys later. All right, and we are out. So that was the first time I've uh, ever done a recording of the show live. So for those of you guys uh, that tuned in on here, a couple of you left some comments for me. Um, I really appreciate that. Michael, I did see your follow up to that one about the autocorrect. I mean, you know, it, it, it gets all of us. So no, no problems there. But uh, yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you uh, enjoyed tuning in. Uh, hopefully I can do more of these going forward and, and hopefully we can get a few more people involved. So uh, it kind of just grows from there. But uh, thanks for, for tuning in and uh, hopefully I'll have this episode probably later out tonight.